Hey everyone, it's Eric here. Welcome to this video. Um, this video will look at how I made my song, The List at Present. Um, I'll go over a couple of things. Uh, firstly, I'll talk about how this song came about. Some, um, you know, some sort of philosophy about how I made this song and, and the kind of approach I used to make it as well as why I chose that approach. Um, I'll also be talking about how I formulated the idea for it um, and and then go through, you know, how I, I wrote the song, how I structured it, how I arranged it, etc, etc, uh, down to how I mixed and then how I mastered it. So let's dive right in. First of all, um, I want to talk a little bit about how and why I decided to make this song and and you know, why I choose to use the approach I did to make it. Um, I made this song because, uh, um, <laughs> well, I guess because uh, at the time I decided to do it, my, my, my audience of my, you know, my listeners were at a peak, at a, at a somewhat all-time high uh, in the, you know, in the mid-1000s a month. So I wanted to sort of, I guess give them something um, new and and also uh, use this opportunity use use the you know use this moment in time where I had such a, a large audience to release something new I hadn't because I hadn't released anything since I think December last year or, or November last year or something like that so I thought you know because my audience is at such a such a sort of an all time high. I might as well uh, put something out and uh, see how well it does and uh, see how many people it can reach organically. So um, that having uh, been said about you know those that part of my motivation to make this song, um, there is another part of my motivation, um, and that is because uh, over the last few months I have kind of shifted my music production um, philosophy and I've kind of become a lot more open towards using uh, different software plugins and even different gear um, but you know software plugins to start with I've suddenly sort of become really warm to the idea of um, using uh, plugin emulations of analog hardware and uh, this is because, partly because of a few things, and I'll go over them really quickly now. So I was in the market for a brand new audio interface. Um, I don't know, a few months ago, say six months ago or so. And uh, I, uh, I settled on the Universal Audio Vault uh, 476, which is what I'll show here on the screen. Nope, not that. Uh, wait, where is it? This thing here. Um, yeah, so I had settled on buying this and it came with a bunch of uh, included Universal Audio plugins. Sorry, hang on a second. I'm going to fix my mic stand. Hopefully that is better. All right, and now we'll just go with it. Um, yeah, where is it? Yeah, so it came with a bunch of included plugins. Um, a couple of them were the uh, Teletronics LA two A, um, and like I think a, a plate reverb, which I didn't quite like when I tried it at the start, but. Um, yeah, so I got this audio interface. It came with bundled software. It was like a time limited promotion. So I, I got this LA-2A and of, of course, um, at that stage, I already knew that the LA-2A is paired uh, with the 1176. So I uh, there was a sale going 
and I bought the native plugin for the 1176 and I thought, okay, cool. Now I've got, now I've got this set, you know, um, it's kind of, obviously they're classic analog compressors and I was happy to sort of make do with that. And then there was another sale and, uh, it, this time it was on their pull tech rendition and I, I bought it and I hadn't, I hadn't, I didn't try it before. I, I can't be bothered downloading trials of plugins in, in most cases. Um, so I bought it and then I put it on a MIDI acoustic guitar track and I was blown away with how good it made it sound. It instantly made this MIDI acoustic guitar track sound like a real acoustic guitar and sound like a real good acoustic guitar. So from then on, I was absolutely sold on the universal audio um, emulations of these plug plugins, like, you know, this, these hardware, um, sorry, these plugin emulations of these um, hardware, you know, gear, this hardware gear. And uh, ever since then, I've been kind of going down the rabbit hole of collecting more and more obviously i got the the 2a and the 76 because they had to be a pair and i knew that they were classic compressors i was almost going to stop there because i knew that it was going to be a rabbit hole but then i because obviously the pull tech is such a famous passive tube eq and in real life it costs like thousands of dollars i thought i'd get the plug-in emulation of that and just try it out and it blew me away for it. so from then on i went down this rabbit hole of collecting more and more plugins it had to run run natively because i don't have i didn't have an apollo or an arrow um universal audio interface to run the dsp on so it had to all be native and at the time of recording this video um the the native plugin the list of native plugins available uh from universal audio are are limited it's growing but it's it's still limited you know um but yeah i'm i'm happily collecting um and i'm happily using them so i thought that what i'd what i would do um what i'd do now that i have these plugins is to try and emulate a recording chain or a recording process um like you know as if it was uh sort of done in the analog domain so things like using outboard gear and then running them into a console um and then perhaps uh, going to another console for mixing and then you know running it to tape and blah 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 and uh, using some out uh, some outboard gear for the mix bus and things like that so i full disclaimer i did not I have had no experience recording anything in the in the analog way like I've never even I don't know if I've even seen a, a recording console in real life so I have no idea how that's actually done I just kind of looked it up and and had a look at the typical signal path for something recorded with outboard gear um, in an analog way and and I kind of that's what I came up with so I decided to try out this philosophy and it was going to go this way it was going to be like I record everything uh, in an analog style oops analog style right um, and uh, then you know all the audio obviously is going to Pro Tools so there's conversion um, well I mean the only analog signal would be my mic that I'm using and then it would just kind of the the plug-in signal chain the plug-in kind of chain that I'm using would emulate like the an the actual analog signal path and then I'll go and use um you know for that that plug-in chain to emulate the analog outboard gear I'll be using lots of plugins that do that such as um the, the universal audio plugins that I just mentioned before, as well as some others from various other manufacturers. Um, and then I would do most of the sort of surgical mixing with um, EQs and compressors with, with sort of the more digital clean uh, EQs and compressors that I've got, uh, namely FabFilter. Um, and then, yeah, and then I'll bounce it off 
and see what we got. So I wanted to make this song, yeah, for twofold. One, because at the time I had a very large audience and I wanted to see how this would do, whether it would be well received, whether it would, you know, uh, increase my audience further. And secondly, because I wanted to try out this new way of producing music. So, um, yeah, let's, uh, now that I've talked about the genesis of this song, let's talk about ideas formulation. So I kind of had some lyric ideas floating around in my mind and, and, uh, sort of, I, I had a, a general idea of what I might like the song to sound like, what I might like, um, the kind of the vocals to sound like whether I want it to be more sing-songy or whether I want it to be more in line with with rap or faster uh, rhythmic singing with a simpler melody um, and I wanted to do a, a bit of both I wanted to kind of have maybe like the chorus be more sing-songy and then the verses be sort of like more in line with rap music and uh and yeah, I, I knew that I wanted to have a, a fairly traditional kind of song structure. So we might go for like a eight bar intro or something like that. And then um, depending on how the verses were going to be either like a 16 bar verse or, or, um, or I don't know, like a 32 bar verse. I don't know if that's what I would normally do. Um, and then an eight bar chorus and then another verse and then uh and then another uh, maybe another two choruses and then that will be it um perhaps a fade out um on the last chorus or i'll just have a fade out for for a last chord after the third chorus so i was like uh not not quite sure um about those specifics but i knew that it would be a fairly traditional song structure. Um, I, the first thing I came up with, uh, with respect to any melodic or musical ideas for this song was the main chorus melody. It goes da 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 from there, I wrote the chords to it because, you know, that's naturally what comes after. So I generally for, you know, when I'm making a song, I'm generally thinking about the lyrics um, and the melody, the vocal line for those lyrics around the same time. And that's typically the first things I'll do. Um, when I'm writing a song and, and this song was no exception. So I had that down pat and I knew that that was going to be the chorus. I liked it. It, it stuck in my head and it was hooky to me. Um, so I went with that. And then, uh, kind of, I, I made, um, some pad sounds, uh, and, uh, I just did that through MIDI. I, I recorded through, um, yeah, I recorded the MIDI songs on the MIDI sounds, sorry, uh, on my MIDI keyboard. And that's it here. I've highlighted here. I've called it piano support because the sound that I've got for it is, uh, based off the piano support preset. So I've got this saved as my own preset, but what it really is, is, uh, I think it's the soft pads somewhere down here yeah it's piano support there the first time i heard it i was just in love with it because it was a very sort of like ethereal pad sound and i loved it so much so so much like it was at the time the set the absolute uh sound that i was looking for like i was looking for a particular sound in my head i had just started using this synthesizer it's called um hybrid three by AI uh, instruments, um, and uh, yeah, that's uh, that's the sound that I that I found back then. It would have been like maybe five, six years ago, and I made my own preset. I've, I tweaked some parameters to my taste, and I just slap it on. Like I use this on every single song. You you'll be able to hear it. Like it has this 
has this sound that is um, both warm, but also has some high end to it as well. And obviously you can tweak this further with EQ and stuff like that, but it's just, it's just what I, what I wanted. Um, so that's that. Unfortunately, I just, just a quick note. Unfortunately, I can't play any audio from Pro Tools. Um, so you guys won't be able to hear what this sounds like uh, right now through this video. Uh, a couple of reasons. Firstly, I haven't been able to figure out how to route the audio from Pro Tools um, through to this video mixing plugin that I'm using to record the video today. Uh, it was already a miracle that I was able to um, route the <laughs> route the audio that's been captured through my microphone and through my interface to this to this video. So uh, I don't really want to push my luck there. Um, but yeah, you'll be able to hear this on the actual song itself, the list at present, and also pretty much on like every single other song. I'm pretty sure that this is on every single song. If not every single song, then maybe 99% of the songs that I've currently released. So that's that sound. And from there, okay, so I would have had this piano support sound. These are just chords. These are just pads. Um that are being played and from there I built the rest of the song like I, I wrote the lyrics um, whilst listening to this sometimes not listening to it sometimes just like staring at the staring at the the, the blank page um, writing the lyrics sometimes actually listening to the chords and and trying to figure it out but what I built the song off of is um, are these pads this pad sound as well as the you know, I already had the genesis of the I already had the idea of the the vocal line for the chorus So I, I built it from there and I'll quickly show you my lyrics So here they are All right, so there we go. So there my these are my lyrics um, My mom never cared much for my taste that was the first line I came up with um that's really, I had a hard time tossing up whether I was going to keep that line or whether I was going to change it because, because right off the bat, I think it gives some rather strange connotations and perhaps mixed messages. Like what, what does it mean? My mom never cared for much for my taste. Well, let me clear that up right now, right here, right now. Okay. So. I was thinking about the fact that when I was a kid, my mom bought my clothes for me. Obviously I'm a kid, like I've got no money and I can't take myself shopping, right? But she bought the clothes for me and I never got to choose what I wanted to wear. Um, it was always what she thought made me look good. And it definitely wasn't the going fashion at the time. It definitely wasn't what I wanted to wear. And it definitely wasn't what I thought made me look good. So, uh, yeah, that line is basically saying that um, my mama never cared if I liked the clothes that she bought for me or not. But, you know, that's I don't know why that that's in that's in there. Like it, it doesn't really I don't know. I don't know how much sense it makes. It probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense to a lot of people. But um, yeah, that's that. That's the line. And then from there, it just like I tossed up on whether I should keep it for so long. Um, eventually, I decided just to build the song around it. I kept it because it had a very like it sort of it was a thing. Uh, it just uh, it just stuck with me and I couldn't shake it and um, it was the feeling that that the line brought to me um, that I knew that I had to stick with it like you can't you can't overthink these things it came to me that line came to me it popped up in my head the way it was um, and to to not put it in there uh, would not be doing the song justice so I, I built it from there and I eventually started talking about independence from parents and stuff like that 
and uh, that's basically the first chorus. The chorus is just basically about growing up and being independent, I suppose. And then I got a couple of verses, right? I got these verses. Um, let me just move me out of the way. The verses are are from an idea of of name dropping a couple of people like a couple of uh, well-known people okay so we've got you can see here i've got this j co thing right did he go and take a sea valley flight home if you know what i'm talking about then oh crap if you know what i'm talking about then you know what i'm talking about if you don't then don't worry about it and then i got this the rake okay originally these this person and this person went by their actual names uh you know <laughs> so i i wrote i wrote these lines around that and and i had the actual name so the first verse was all about i guess comparing me and other people and us and i guess my peers with some of these well-known people like J. Co. and The Rake and then we got J. Jilla, right? and uh, Jim Shady, right? Um, so that was that was the kind of idea for verse 1 and, and I guess I wanted the song to be like a G up, you know? I wanted the song to be encouragement for other people, mainly my peers um, and for anyone, anyone struggling, right? So yeah, I had, I had that in mind and I had also written parts of the second verse. Um, I'm pretty sure I finished the second verse before I finished the first, but the second verse, uh, was, uh, I had this idea to reference and perhaps even talk to people that I knew in my personal life. So we've got, we've got a couple of lines, um, that's about someone, oh, this whole, this whole, um, four bar segment is about somebody I know. Um, and then this is another, this is also about a couple of people I know. And yeah, so all these four bar segments, four times four, 16 bars, um, are about people I know and I'm kind of referencing them name dro name dropping without dropping any names and talking to them um, and it was supposed to be a lot more personal than the than the yeah than the first verse so I kind of I interchanged between the second verse and the first verse and kind of um, when I was writing this because some ideas for the second verse came to me and I knew that they only fit for the second verse and vice versa for the first verse, like some ideas came for the first verse that I knew would fit in the first verse only. So it kind of goes from this macro level um, writing to this kind of micro level writing where like in verse two, we're getting a lot more personal and I'm referencing individual people in my life. Um, and yeah, and uh, that's that. And uh, I kind of, uh, um, throughout writing the lyrics and especially having settled on the line nowadays, if I got rules then I break them, that's a reference to kind of my philosophy of, of music production that I've had held for a very long time, ever since I started making, uh, music to, I guess even now, like here I've got choruses BG Vox Harmony. Now, for those of you who don't know, I'm talking about how the chorus includes background vocals as a harmony. Now, I one of the things that I had been very, very particular about ever since I started making music was I hate background vocals with a passion and I will never do it. So I had always been like, okay, I'm never gonna do background vocals like I'd, I never understood it you know if I was um, if I was at a rock show and um, there's like a, a singer and a guitarist and and he or she is is playing guitar and singing and then they've got you know uh, 
some guys and girls around the back um towards the back of the stage kind of like bobbing along with the music and and singing ah you know all that stuff like harmonies and stuff like i never understood like why they were there what are they doing at this at this rock rock concert um doing that kind of stuff like so i always hated the idea um but i thought you know what it's really time i broke these rules because the rules are they're not really based on anything like uh anything with substance so i might as well just break it like i talk about nowadays if i got rules then i break them so i go ahead and decide that one of the defining features of the chorus has to be the background uh, vox harmony and then um yeah what when the lyrics were were done and even perhaps when they were 95 percent done i went ahead and and started planning the music and and i worked out that it was going to be an a minor because of the the melody that i had sung uh when i first wrote the the very first chorus line and then the chord progression um is right here like it follows follows the melody uh you can see here the tempo is 81 crotchet beats per minute and the the rhyming pattern is a a b b because that's just what it was and I had to go, I really had to go with my gut when I was writing these lyrics. I did have a hard time a harder time than usual writing uh, writing and completing these lyrics because I put a lot of pressure on myself to to hurry up and get it done um so I can get the song released while I thought my audience was at its peak level so that it was, you know, hopefully it could reach a lot of people. So uh, I had I hadn't even planned on on releasing a new song and and generally speaking I don't release singles that aren't part of an, an EP or aren't part of an album. So uh, that was uh, this song was the exception to that case. So I really had to put a lot of pressure. The first kind of lines that I came up with, I knew that I couldn't be I didn't have the time to just overanalyze and overthink them and keep on changing them and come up with a uh, a different rhyming pattern because I thought one might be better than the other. I just went with it. Like the lines that felt natural, I just went with it and I knew that I had to, it had to be that way. Otherwise, the song just wouldn't feel genuine. Like I'd be, I'd be recording this song and it just wouldn't work for me. Um, and then you'll be able to hear that through the performance. If I don't, if I don't believe in what I'm recording, then you'll be able to hear it through the performance. So that's that. Like the lyrics were done, and uh, what I did then was I printed this this track, this piano support track, and then I, you know, printed. By that I mean I recorded it onto an audio track, so it's just an an audio track. It's not taking up any CPU power. Um, and I think, where is that track? Uh, it's right here. So there's my piano support track um, in audio. Uh, and then hide and make an active as I normally do after I print it. Um, I recorded the vocals just going off the click and the piano support track, which is exactly how I wanted to do it. I wanted to make sure the vocals were down pat, the lyrics were written, the vocals were recorded, and then I wanted to build the song around it. And then I was open to changing around the structure if that's what needed to happen. So uh, let me just talk really quickly about how I recorded vocals. Um, I did so through this Rode NT2A. You can see that right here, road NT2A. I have all these settings. Um, so the top one, I had it in the cardioid position. I believe that's what it is in this picture right here. Um, and I have a flat, I don't engage any high pass filters and then I don't engage any padding. So it's at, at unity for the, for the input level. I'm also using this very mic to record my vocals right now. I apologize if you guys hear some buzzing i yeah i'm hearing some buzzing i don't know where that's coming from um but yeah sorry about that uh i i've got the gain really high up on my audio interface because the mic is kind of 
quite a while away, maybe, uh, maybe even 10 inches away from my face. So, um, yeah, I've got the gain right up there. Um, and I just bumped it up a little bit more right now. Uh, so from there, uh, it's going into my audio interface, which I said before was a, our vault universal audio vault 476. Now, just a quick note on these pictures. I took them from the websites. So from this, for this picture, I took it from the universal audio website and this picture, I took it from the road website. If you guys want to sue me, then, you know, come at me, but come on, I'm doing free advertising for you and you know, you didn't even ask for it. So I'm helping you out. So don't sue me, please. But those pictures and the copyright belongs to them. You know, this one, Universal Audio, this one, Rode. So Rode NT2A, um, going straight into the Universal Audio Vault 476. I'm going into uh, channel number one here and I'm not engaging this compressor or this vintage circuit. I tried it um, to, to do serious recordings with these two circuits engaged, uh, but I didn't like it. And you can see my videos on this um, elsewhere on this channel. I talk about how the very, very, very first time I heard the 76 compressor and the vintage circuit on this audio interface, I was blown away. I was so impressed that I called up a music shop that I had ordered a proper like $1,000 plus mic preamp, a tube mic preamp. And I said, just cancel the order, bro. Like I'm, I'm super in love with the sound that the Volt 476 gives me with these two circuits engaged. So I'm, yeah, I don't think I need that $1,000 outboard external tube mic preamp and you know i had to pay some money for them to cancel the order because they ordered it specifically for me um and sold it to me like i had already paid for the whole thing in full um then i said i don't want it anymore so i had to pay a little bit of money for them to to refund the majority of the one thousand dollars i got back but that's how much i was impressed with these these two features um, that I went ahead and I was happy to cancel that order. But then when I went down to actually record with it seriously, like it just sounded like garbage. The, the, the distortion and the harmonic saturation that you get when engaging this vintage circuit is actually super harsh. And I would not want to bake that into my audio. And this compressor, like all it really does is add some gain to the to the level like i don't i swear i don't even hear any compression at all to be honest with you or maybe a little bit if your if your signal really really jumps up high but like it it's just adding volume to it and to me like it, it was quite crap um i am using these two circuits right now for recording this video though just because i needed a little bit more gain um from my mic because my mic is just so far um, so far away from my face. I hope I'm not blowing your ears off when you guys are listening. This is my first time. I know I'm ranting and I'm very tangential, which is what I normally am. Uh, but this is the first time I'm doing this video, like any kind of video like this before. I, I mean, like at all, like I haven't done a video like this at all before. So sorry about that. Let's go back to the point. So the vocals are being recorded through this Rode NT2A into channel one of my Universal Audio Vault 476. I've got the gain at maybe 11 o'clock. I don't have the vintage or the 76 compressor circuit engaged. Um, from there, it's going into Pro Tools 11. This is actually Pro Tools 12. I've since upgraded um, since I made this song, but it was going into Pro, Tool, Pro Tools 11. Uh, yeah, so that's that. And then what I did was I comped the vocal. So let's have a look to see if the original vocals are still here. Yeah, so those are the chorus comped. Comped just means, um, like 
having made a composite track. So for the life of me, I, I don't know if I can find the verse one. Mm -hmm. No, I don't think I can find the verse one, but let me just show you with the chorus chorus ones to see so you can see what kind of idea uh, so sorry i mean i'm not talking properly so you can have an idea of what i'm talking about see obviously here um all these clips are different colors and they come from different takes what i would have done is uh see i've sung this um seven eight times right this is chorus fox one uh, yep. Eight times. And then I'll listen to every single line. I chose the best take of that line and I moved it up to the main track. And then I did that for all the other lines. And then I must not have been happy with my, the first time I did it. So I, I sang it again. And then I did it again. Like I comped. I took one, two, three, four, five takes and I made a composite track um, of all the best parts of all those five takes and put it up in this, in this uh, what's called composite track. So I'm not sure whether I then went and got the best bits from each take. So you can see this is the very first line and the very second line. So I separate these lines um, into you know where the breaths are let's just zoom in here a little bit so right in this gap is where i would have taken a breath so i call this like before and after each breath this will be one line so i'm not quite sure whether i went in and chose um the best out of two of these two but i probably did so that's that's comping done then what i would have done is um I would have gone, no, I'm not going to say I would have, like, this is what I actually did do. I, um, kind of listened to them against the click track and moved it with this dragging tool forwards or backwards in time to try and fit the beat as, as good as possible, as well as possible. So like, uh, Obviously, I'm only human, so when I'm singing, it's not it's not a hundred percent in time. I've found that these days when I sing, um, it's like maybe ninety five percent locked down. Like I'm pretty happy with it, but to just kind of lock it down even further, I'll just move them around. And I know when I'm doing that, I normally make sure the main the main words that that fall on the main beats actually are aligned with the main beats um and i don't worry too much about the 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 notes that would be in between the main beats but generally speaking like once once i've got those locked down everything else is more or less in time that like you wouldn't be able to tell um whether it's in time or not and then what i did is I used Elastic Audio and I locked it down even further. So this is the, this track here is the chorus. Um, is the chorus that uh, I, I did what's called shifting, shifting in time. Oh no, this is the guide vocal. Okay, that's all right. Yeah, so I, sorry about that. Another tangent here. This track here that you see is um, the chorus from a guide vocal that I cut. Um, it was like a scratch vocal. Um, I wasn't very serious when I did it. Like I knew that it, I was going to sing it again. But I actually thought the performance was pretty damn good. So I kept it and I did some work on it in terms of editing and shifting in time. Like, you know, moving the clips forward and backwards as well as elastic audio. So I did some proper work on it because I was intending to see whether it would fit in the final mix. 
Um, but yeah, I didn't end up using it. I used the, the actual two chorus, um, the actual, uh, the two proper comped choruses that, that you see right here. Um, yeah. So let me see if I can find where I did that. If I can't, then I can't. Ah, it's all right. All right. So I would have done what's called elastic audio, put that in X form rendered only. Um, so there's no real time rendering and then move the place some warp markers at, at major points in each line. Like, uh, I don't do so many consonants. I learned the hard way that if you kind of use elastic audio on consonants, it doesn't work so well. So I, I mainly put them on the vowel sound. So once I put the warp markers in place, I kind of lock it down even further, but these are the tiniest adjustments because remember we've already, I've already shifted the clips forwards and backwards to lock down against the grid. And um, it's already pretty, pretty close to being perfectly in time, like locked down on the grid perfectly in time. So I'm just making tiny adjustments, like moving the warp marker just a little bit to lock down on the grid even further. Um, some lines for whatever reason will, will have major digital artifacts when you render it um, and it just doesn't work. So for those parts, I just leave it alone. Like it's not worth hearing a pop or a click or, or whatever, or some kind of other digital artifact. Um, just to make sure it's 100% in time. Like for those situations, I just leave it. So that's that. So um, what have we covered? Yep, shifted in time, elastic audio. And then from there, what I did was, um, I, I kind of ran it through this analog vocal chain. So, this is, uh, oh no, no, sorry. No, I didn't. What I did then, was run it through some more plugins. You see here, I've got what's called the corrector bus and I'll show you what that looks like. So these are all my secrets guys, but it's okay. So first off, I've got, um, this is my chain that I use to run my vocals through. I've got um, Fab Filter Pro Q3. I've got this preset that I made myself. It's called um, Eric's NT2A Corrector. So the NT2A mic, which, I'm which I use to record the vocals through and that I'm using now to speak through, has an EQ curve and I looked up this EQ curve and I mirrored it on the Fab Filter Pro Q3 and then I just inverted the gain. So what it theoretically what it should be doing is making the frequency of anything that's recorded through the road my road NT2A flat. Now I don't know if it's 100% perfect or accurate in that sense because firstly I don't know if I can't be sure that I that I did this uh, EQing right like I don't know if I've got the the amount of gain reduction correct I don't know if I've got the frequencies correct all I know is I tried to mirror it and then I put it kind of side to side on my screen and I was pretty happy that it was the best I could do to mirror it, And then I just inverted the gain. So I'm hoping that it's, it's doing something and, um, doing as much as it can to correct the frequency response of the road NT2A. So I've got that running, running. Um, I've, I've got my, my vocals running through that. And then I've got the suit too. I've got a default preset. I've kind of, cranked it pretty high on these ones here. But you know, this is more or less a full band, um, a full band kind of 
soother like you know I've got I've got I've got a boost it pretty much from 1k all the way up the top generally speaking I find that my voice has some sizzle at 2k 4k um, 11k and 15k I found that the soothe 2 doesn't really do very much to correct the higher frequencies like above say above 6k I don't think it does it's that sensitive to it but I've tried to crank it there nonetheless so from there I've got the spiff which is cutting some some vocal clicky noise that's generally above here now I've got you know when I record vocals sometimes there's clicks that are recorded through I don't know where it's from it, it might be from the mic or the cable that I'm using all I know is that I thought it was from um, my ART Tube MP Studio V3 at Tube preamp right here but I haven't been using this uh, recently ever since I got the vault uh, but regardless, there's still there's still a click there, so it must be something else in the chain. Probably my microphone or the microphone cable. Um, but regardless, this spiff is also cutting a little bit of the mouth, the mouth sounds like especially um, when I when I do like N and M sounds, um, you'll hear a little bit of the the pop and also when my tongue moves um, during singing and, and recording vocals when my tongue moves you can hear the tongue kind of pushing away the saliva in my mouth and, and that is audible and that's captured through the mic so spiff kind of um, does its job to cut as much of that out as possible now next I've got the um, SPL Transient Designer Plus that's just cutting a little bit of room noise I can't you can't go crazy with it like you can't cut more than I'd say 12 dB of it of the sustain here because then you like your vocals will become really really choppy and sound really really wonky so I just conservatively cut maybe 6 dB of the sustain off it and that's all I use this for here um yeah, I'll talk about the Transient Designer Plus in another video, but I love it. It's a great tool. So I've run my vocal through that, and I'm doing this not only for the chorus verse, chorus parts that you see here, but also for the verse parts and uh, the background, the background vocal harmonies. Uh, sorry, that I've highlighted here. Um, so I'm doing that. Uh, for all the vocals that go through all the vocals go through the same chain here because it went through the same microphone um, and then I print that onto audio and I'll just show you with the example of my chorus here I have highlighted um, this is my this is my chorus I printed it onto this track uh, so that's the audio that has run through these plugins that we just talked about and that's it there and then on this track let me just hide and make an act of these ones on this track here I've labeled it chorus vox 4 and a print uh, let's just go through that up here I will try and move this let me try and move this to the middle a bit so here's our, uh, how about that? Yep, here it is right here. That's our track. Uh, as you can see up here, I've got the Neve 1073 um, Universal Audio. Uh, I had to subscribe to the, uh, what's it called? The Spark subscription to get access to this. They have this in native which is why I'm able to use it but they just haven't released it on the store yet I don't know why I know that this is gonna sell a lot of units so I have no idea why they're not releasing it uh, but but there it is like I had to subscribe they had this uh, spark subscription deal 
for 99 cents for three months. So I, I did that um, so I could use this plugin and try out this vocal chain. This is the first time I'm trying, remember this is the first time I'm trying printing or, or committing audio that I've recorded through plugin emulations of analog hardware gear. So here, this is the, these are the settings I used. I had, I just used the line. I don't know, like I was wondering whether I should use the line or the mic input. And I watched one of those videos, those quick tip videos that Universal Audio do. And they were running vocals through the line input. So I thought I'd do that too. I thought that was the right way. I've since learned that you can actually use the mic input and then just decrease the input level either by the pad or I think by the fader, I don't know. I, I would, I just use the pad um, and it gives a different sound, but I didn't know that back then. And these were the settings I used. If I was to do this over again, I would pop this over to the mic uh, input and then just engage the pad to control the level and make sure it doesn't clip. But, you know, this is what I did. So let's run with it. I've got a little bit of air on the, on the high shelf here. I'm cutting some 700 Hertz, cutting a little bit of 110 uh, with the low shelf. And then I've got the high pass filter at 50 here. Obviously the EQ is engaged and I had to cut the level down by a lot. I don't know why, maybe, um, oh, I do know why. And it is because I think I cranked it really, really high. Did I? I don't know. I'll watch this video back in the edit and see if I did. But I cranked the vocals really, really high, I'm pretty sure. Because I wanted to get like a super, super toasty flavor. Um, so I thought the, uh, the best way to get that amount of desired saturation was to crank it, crank this line input, and then just cut the output, uh, gain with this kind of knob here. So that's exactly what I did. Then I ran it into the soft tubes, CL1B, which is, uh, well, obviously everyone knows the, the pairing of a Neve 1073 into, into a CL1B. These are the settings I used. This was, I think, also the first time I was using this um, this compressor plugin. So I just had no idea what I was doing. I knew that the ratio had to be really down low because I just wanted, I didn't want actual extreme compression at this stage. Uh, I, uh, I just left it at a ratio of two to one, threshold at minus 12. Uh, going for about 2 to 3 dB of gain reduction. Fast attack and release. I've got it in manual mode because apparently these fixed modes, they, you know, you can't really adjust the time constants. And I don't know why anyone would want that. Like, you you need to be able to adjust those time constants. So I put it in manual. Uh, use the, in, in, set this to internal sidechain, but I don't even have the the side chain engage, which doesn't really matter. So this is just kind of, I guess, controlling the, the very highest peaks a little bit. It's not doing a lot of compression, which is what I wanted. Next, we've got the black box. Oh my God, I love this plugin. And I'll go into, excuse me, I'll go into more depth um, about this plugin at a later stage. But as you can see here, I've literally just got this in the factory default setting and engage the saturation, the parallel saturation circuit. And that is it. You can, I'll go more into this later on in another video, but you can put this plugin on anything and everything at its default state and it will make it sound better. I know that the pentode and triode are kind of two differently voiced tubes or emulating two differently voiced tubes. One is more even order harmonics and the other is more order, order harmonics, but I just couldn't even be bothered changing those to taste. Like I whack it on, um, engage the parallel saturation circuit and that's it. 
it makes everything sound way better. Um, so that's what I did with the vocal. Then we've got the Pool Tech EQP1A, which is like one of the most renowned plugins ever. I've got the I've got the attenuation of 100 hertz set to about two. Then I boosted about 8k with a broad Q attenuated from 10k onwards, um, setting at two. I don't know if I knew what I was doing at this stage, but like it is what it is I, this is the as i said a couple of times before this is the first time i did any music production this way um next we've got the meq5 which is the pool tech uh sort of mid frequencies eq i'm cutting some 1k and i'm pretty sure I, i'm boost i don't know i'm boosting a little bit of 5k i don't know what i was doing um, I, I freely admit back then I didn't know what I was doing. Again, this is not my first time using these plugins, so to you know to make music this way. So I was just mucking around and seeing what I came up with. Is there anything down here? No, there's nothing. Okay, so um, oof, I don't know. I was super conservative with my plugin count, just five plugins, um, and that was it. If I was to do this again, I would probably have five more um anyway that's what it was from there i printed it onto uh a track oh you see new chorus here i kind of uh changed the analog plugin chain a little bit um with different settings on the eq but I didn't end up using that, so don't worry about that. We won't go into that today. I then printed it onto a track called Chorus Box 4AT, which I'm making active right now. So let's just drag this down here a little bit. Let's make this inactive. Free up some CPU. All right, so we've got Autotune 8.1, and I bought this eons ago. I, I kid you not, probably like 10 years ago, I bought this. It's still going strong. I know that there's like way more flashy versions of Autotune out these days, but this has always worked for me, and uh, I do really like the the options for automatic uh, mode with the natural vibrato correction style and humanize. Um, uh, settings um, so I like Autotune 8.1 I don't feel like uh, you know upgrading anytime soon but for this song I use it in graph mode I often use it in graph mode and then I might print another copy through um, with with automatic Autotune um, so I, I graphically e I graphically Autotuned uh, the vocals that I had run through this plugin chain that we had just talked about. Um, yeah, that's how I did it. And then I printed it. Let's see if I can find where it was printed. Uh, yeah, I printed it. Here it is. That's it there. Let's drag it down so everyone can see. Printed onto this track and then I was deciding whether or not I should um, whether or not I should run the automatic auto tune through it and then print it that way. I tried it, I didn't like it, I didn't think it fit. I didn't think it fit um, my vocals for this, so I didn't do it. Uh, and that was that. So I got the chorus vox. I did the same thing for the verse vocals as well. And then uh, I just moved them onto, I combined them onto like this track here, um, this vox track here, cause they, they fit, like I could fit them all on one track. Um, so like, why not free up even more CPU power? Uh, and just automate the volume changes, which is uh, what, exactly what I did. So, those were the vocals done. Um, 
after I did that with the vocals, uh, I think I ran through the corrector bus again, except this time I only used, um, I think I only used soothe and spiff again. I didn't use the corrector or the, or the transient designer again, cause I didn't need to, like it was already, this curve had already been printed on. And, uh, I think the, the room noise had already been attenuated. So that was it. So I soothed it again. Cause after you run it through, um, those analog plugins, uh, they add some high end noise and that kind of accentuated the sizzle in my vocal, which I don't like. And then the auto tune, even though we used it graphically, it kind of, it kind of makes it a little bit more harsh. So, um, yeah, I ran it through, that was a bird. I ran it through these, uh, the soothe and the spiff again. I can't say enough good things about the Oaks, Oak sound, soothe two and spiff, like, you know, they're really, really good. And I can't imagine ever mixing or making music without them again. Like it was amazing. Um, yeah. Okay. So that was that. Then what I did, uh, was I, okay. I think it's easier to show you guys on, um, the actual tracks. So here's my verse. All right. So that's the verse chorus. All right. Here's the verses. And here's the chorus. Let me just move these down a bit so everyone can see. Um, you can't see it here, but what I did was I went, okay. I went right in to the minute level and I cut everything between the actual words, between the actual lines. So every time there's a breath, like normally if you're singing this live, obviously after you sing this line right here, you're going to take a breath cause you'll be out of breath. And that's where the breath is. But I went through every single time that would have happened and I just cut it. Also cutting any silence between before the lines and after the lines, like I just cut out anything that wasn't actually vocals, vocalizing the words or the lines of the lyrics that includes breaths that includes, uh, silence or idle noises or pauses. So I went through that and I did that for both the chorus and the verse, obviously for the chorus, you only need to do it for one chorus and then you can just copy and paste it for the other choruses. Um, but, yeah, I did that and then I faded. I faded in and I faded I faded in at the start of each line and I faded out at the very end of the line so you don't hear like a cut or a click um when the line starts and ends respectively. So you can you can kind of see that the waveform is going from nothing to, you know, to louder and louder and that's not just because of the word that's because I, I did a fade and typically I fade this, um, I don't know what this is. Uh, that's a semi, demi, semi, demi, semi, demi, demi, semi, or demi, semi, semi, maybe demi, demi, semi quaver. I put the grid into that setting and then I fade in over that amount of time. And then after I did that, I consolidated the clip into one clip to make it easier to work with. And as you can see, I was running with this, with this setup for a long time. Like I had the chorus vocals on one track and the verse vocals on another track, but eventually I collapsed them all into this Vox track right here because it was uh, more freeing for my CPU. My, my computer is not the best. Um, yeah. So I could just cut the amount of plugins in half and, and automate any volume changes between them. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's everything in terms of writing, uh, the lyrics and recording the vocals 
and how I processed the vocals, how I edited the vocals, comp them together, ran them through a plugin chain, etc. So those are the vocals done. And then what I did was I went around to working out the rest of the arrangement, working out the instrumental to go with it. Um, and yeah, I, I kind of wanted it to be as simple as possible. I kind of had this idea. I knew that I wanted to play with dynamics and I wanted to kind of have soft part, like quiet parts and then louder parts and the, you know, the parts would be louder because you would add a whole bunch of stuff. You would add some drums, you would add some other sounds to it. So that's kind of what I did. Um, and I was more confident in my decision making with regards to writing the music because I had the vocals down pat and I, and I knew, you know, I had a rough idea what I wanted at each section of the song. So I wrote, um, I did all my sounds on MIDI. Sorry, that's my mouse. I'll just show you quickly what my drums were. Um, the kind of drums I used. Here I've got, you see highlighted right here, my um, instrument tracks in Pro Tools. I've just got boom, like it's really, really good. Uh, sorry, so it's just these three. Drum sounds, boom. It's a drum machine. I use the same kit. I use the 9.0 kit. Now, I don't know... <laughs> I don't know what an actual 9.09 drum machine sounds like. Because I don't think I've ever heard it. I just... That era of music just was before my time. And when I go back and listen to the era of music that used a lot of 909s, it just doesn't really interest me. But there was something about this kit, especially the kick and the snare sound when I first heard it, that I was like, I really like that kick and the snare sound. So this is the this is basically my the drum sound for 99% of my songs. So I've got the boom going for the, the hats, the snare and the clap. And over here, I've got the high pads. It's just uh, some more high-end kind of ethereal-like pads by the AI Art Instruments Expand 2. Um, these are stock plugins. These are stock Pro Tools plugins, by the way. I haven't found any need to not use them and then go out and buy like virtual instruments that cost like three, four hundred dollars when I, I kind of learned how to make music using these stock plugins and they've served their purpose. Like I don't have any other need um, apart from them, like not yet at the very least. So yeah, those are my drum sounds. As you can see, here's my arrangement in the chorus. I've got the clap going, but I've got the high pads going basically from verse one onwards. So let's hide that and then let's see. Oh, okay. Let's talk about my 808. My 808 sound, here it is. Again, this is boom. This is just a fat eight. Like, if the 80 kit is supposed to be the 808, I don't know what this is supposed to be. Maybe this is supposed to be the 808 and then the other is supposed to be something else. No idea. There's also the fat nine, but I use the fat eight. What I do is I just crank the delay, the decay to 100, so there's like a long held note for the kick. And then you can tune it. You can tune it to actual notes. I know that if this knob is set to zero, then zero semitones, then it the note is E1. So add five semitones, and what is that? Uh, I think it's A, it's A1. Um, which would make sense because there is an A note in my, my chord progression. So what I had to do with this, oh, it's actually more complicated than anyone could imagine. You record the actual MIDI data, as you can see right here. Record the MIDI data, make it as long as you, you think you need it to be, as long as the note will actually hold out. Tune the, a, tune the, the kick 
sound to the frequency, I mean, sorry, to the pitch that you need it to, and then you you print it, and then you, and that that's one note, and then you retune it to another note, and then you print it again, and then you do that for all the notes in your chord progression, like all the baseline notes in your chord progression, and then you chop up that audio, and you, I'll, sh I'll actually show you on this, you chop up that audio, and then you put them together, Let's see what, oh, here we go. Yeah, we're just waiting for the activate track. Yeah, so this is exactly it. Just, uh, I'll just uh, printed each of these notes, F1, E1, D1, A1, right? And then I've chopped up, chopped the, the start bit off, and then you just kind of arrange them into a track like I have up here into your progression, one after the other. Obviously, because the progression is the same throughout the entire song and it repeats, you can just, like, you can just copy and paste. But again, it's not as simple as someone, for example, on FL Studio just playing on the keyboard. I envy those people. But if I wanted an 808 sound, this is what I had to go through to get it. So that's the 808. What else have we got? Talking about piano support. Yep, yeah, so we've got some an electric piano, bells, and the prophet. Um, yeah, just activating again. The um the electric piano is one of the staple sounds in my in my songwriting like i it's it's the it's kind of the rice to an to an asian guy's diet pretty much like i will have it in every single song just like just like an asian guy would have rice in every single meal guy or girl um and the, ele the electric piano sound I am using is the AIR Instruments Velvet. I got this for free. It was bundled software. Um, I, I've had various other electric piano virtual instruments in the past, like the Lounge Lizard, like the Addictive Keys, a um, couple of other ones, I don't even remember. But for the for the reasons that I'm using an electric piano and the way I go about it, nothing beats this. Like I I strip this down to the most simple sound. I take off all the bells and whistles. I take off the mechanic sound, right? I take off the key off sound. I make sure the condition is mint. You know, I don't have any fine tuning. I just want to keep everything locked down. I don't change anything. I turn off the vintage. I don't have any effects going in or out. I don't have any EQ. Everything's flat. There's no, there's no kind of, um, you know, reverb or delay or distortion or any effects. I don't even have the tremolo set. Like everything is as clean and plain Jane as possible in terms of printing the MIDI data. I, I like to do it that way because I want to have as much control as I can during the mixing stage in terms of tweaking the sound whether I want to add chorus to it I'll do it through ascent if I wanted to add distortion on it okay I'll, I'll do that but but I'm not going to print it through the MIDI I'm not going to print and commit it at this stage because I want to be able to tweak it when I'm fitting things in the mix so everything is very very plain Jane here and although the lounge lizard is also very simple I just found that this is is better for me. Like I like the GUI better. I think it has a better sound. The Lounge Lizard has like a handful of sounds and that's it. So I'm using the, I think the Mark One patch from from Velvet on this e piano track. And, and the Mark One is the one that I use most. Like if I want a warm, am I using the Mark One actually? I'm pretty sure I am. If I wanted like a warm all round, I am sound if i wanted it sorry i i said two things at the same time if i wanted a warm all-round sound i would go for the mark one um and and use that 
And then I've got the bells. Um, hybrid, hybrid bells. <laughs> Pretty straightforward. Then I've got the Archuria Prophet. Um, version 3 for some Prophet chords. Yeah, so this is, uh, I've got my preset Eric's The One chords. Uh, it's just doing some some kind of synth stabs for the chorus just to layer layer um, Some more sounds and make the chorus sound even thicker and Then I've got this uh, acoustic guitar this MIDI acoustic guitar This is the first time I'm using uh, MIDI acoustic guitar normally if I wanted acoustic guitar I'll just record my guitar myself because I, I play guitar and I own a couple of guitars but I wanted to do it this way because I'm trying out new things with this song anyway. So I've got the uh, um, applied, is it AAS? I don't remember what they stand for, but the strum session, the same guys that do Lounge Lizard. I've got the strum session. Strum session two here. Again, my approach is to keep it super clean. I don't have any compression, EQ or any effects on. I just wanted it super, super clean so I can tweak those effects in the mix. And then I've got the E guitar, electric guitar, strum session as well. Same deal, super, super clean, just plain Jane. Um, so I can tweak that stuff later. My computer is having a moment here. Here we go. All right, yeah, so that's it, you know. I, I played around with the neck or the bridge pickup to see which one sounded nice. I eventually went with the neck. Um, I, it just sounded warmer to me. I don't know what this is. Oh, maybe the, oh, the amps on. I don't know if there's any, e I don't know if this is my one actually. I don't know if the, the settings changed since I compared it, but I assure you that like, um, oops. I assure you that this was really, really plain Jane. Um, when I, when I when I printed the MIDI, so uh, right, hide and make that inactive. What are we What are we gonna go through next? Um, so we've gone through the 808. Yeah, so that's that. And then I'll just show you with like one one of the sounds. Yeah, here we go. Piano support. Well, I don't want to print. So I printed those the, that MIDI data onto an audio track, and uh, I'll just show you with my piano support pad sound what what I did. I printed it on the let's say it's the piano support sound. There it is onto this track. Let's have a look at what is actually on this chain here. Yeah, so. I ran it through some, some plugins. I ran it through um, an EQ and a compressor. In this case, as is the case with every single other track on in this session, it was the Neve 1073 again. I choose this is my compressor. I mean, sorry, my EQ. I ran every single track that went through MIDI and, and, you know, indeed the vocal track, as we spoke about before, went through this EQ. So I ran everything through this EQ, and I also had at least the compressor. In this case, it's the Teletronics LA-2A. Um, so I ran it through, again, you know, I was talking about at the start of the video that I wanted to make this song um, in like an analog style as much as I could, as much as I had knowledge of. So uh, I, I was going to run everything through um, an, an, an analog outboard EQ and an, an analog outboard compressor. Like in this case, this, these are plug-in emulations. I don't own the actual hardware to it. But I did that for every single track. And I just want to show you another track where I have more stuff going on than just the 1073 and a two-way. Uh, but, but you kind of get the idea. I have some... Ooh, okay. For example, the snare would have gone through some more processing. Oh, 
All right, so the snare here, I've got um, 1073, 1176, and uh, the black box. Um, again, I just sort of, uh, yeah, whacked it on, engaged the uh, parallel saturation circuit and just, yeah, put it on. I put saturation on pretty much every single track um, apart from the pad sounds, uh, everything sounds super, super thick. I think I had a piano sound here as well. We didn't go through it. Where is it? I don't know where the MIDI track for the piano. Oh, here it is. Yeah. So let's, let's go through the piano and then where I printed it. All right, it's activating. Oops. Oh yeah, I had the piano at the very end because I wanted the, the very last chorus to just quieten right down and just have the piano going. So here's the addictive keys. Um, I got this for free <laughs> again. I got most of my plugins for free. Uh, it came with my Focusrite uh, Scarlet interface, but uh, I was on the hunt. Now, the, okay, these are, this is one of the few instances where I was looking to upgrade from the stock uh, plugin. So Pro Tools comes with a stock piano virtual instrument called MIDI Grand. MIDI Grand. Um, I was looking for something with a better sound, like I had grown tired of that sound. I don't think it, it doesn't sound very realistic. It doesn't sound very nice. So I looked around, I had also a couple of other free piano virtual instrument plugins. Nothing beat this. I first came across this and I was like, this is way too complicated. I can't be bothered. Like you're choosing the different kinds of microphones to use and where you're placing them in relation to the piano. There's all these, um, there's all these effects that, that the, the, the chain goes through like noise or compression and distortion and EQ. I was like, I can't be bothered with that. I just want a very clean sound. As you know, from what we were talking about before, I want to make sure that these virtual instruments are plain Jane and vanilla as can be. And so the printed audio from the MIDI track is as plain as possible. So you have a blank canvas to paint upon when you go ahead and do your mix. Um, yeah, I just, I, I saw this and I was thinking like, this is just way too complicated, <laughs> not constipated, complicated. And I don't really want to look at it. So I, I looked at other ones, but nothing sounded as good as this one. I don't know what it was. Maybe it was the samples I used. I don't know what it, what it was, but nothing sounded as good it was as, as this. So I, chose the driest, most clean and plain chain sound I could, like the most ordinary grand piano sound I could from this virtual instrument, Addictive Keys. And then I went through each of these settings, as you can see, there's like all this stuff. I kind of turned off all the, all the effects turn off the vibrato and stuff like that. You don't normally have a vibrato for a piano anyway. And then I went through and I, and I chose the microphones, um, and, and where they were and stuff because I had to, not cause I wanted to, but I went through and, and chose those sounds for each one. You can stack three microphones and you can see that I've done that here. Um, so here I've got, tube that's close you can see that it's here here i've got two ribbons that are like on the side of the piano and then here i've got a tube mic that's like inside the piano and i went through and i kind of removed all these effects i deactivated the noise compression distortion the eq and the chorus as you can see from here and the master effects are also kind of turned off this plugin isn't scaling, so I don't think you can see properly, but there's a way that I can, there is a way that I can see the bottom 
and like turn the effects sends off so oh you can see that here so here the send to effects one which is like a delay i've got it to minus infinity db and once I'm, i was happy once i've set all of those to be the cleanest dry sound possible i saved the preset so i you know you just open up that preset and there it is so that's my piano sound printed it onto this audio track right here as you can see um and then through this through this audio track I've got that chain you can see up here this this chain right here sorry that everything is all over the place got the 1073 then the LA2A and then a black box nowadays if I was to make a piano sound I probably wouldn't put the black box on because it, it might be a bit too gritty but it depends on on the sound I'm looking for so so that's that um, I'm not gonna go through every single track and show you the the chain but it's it's relatively simple and it's more or less the same throughout every single track um, it's a it's a 1073 running through the line input with the EQ engaged and used uh, and then it will be some kind of compressor. I mean, like the ones that I had were, at the time, were the LA2A, the 1176, Fairchild by UAD, um, CL1B. I think that's pretty much it. I learned that... Um, with the, there are certain compressors, definitely certain compressors that you want to use for certain materials. So my go-to compressor for drums was always the 1176. I loved the punch and and the sound that, that it gave my drums and how quick to respond it was. I generally set it to the slowest attack and the fastest release, aiming for about one to three dB of compression. And then I found that the CL1B was best for melodic instruments. Like if I had, uh, you know, a melody line, i would use a CL1B. Uh, like, I don't remember for my bells, whether I use the CL1B or not, these bells here. I could have a look. But if it wasn't the CL1B, then... Um, the LA2A, which is pretty much, okay, not pretty much. They're, they're quite interchangeable. They're very, very similar. The CL1B and the LA2A. Um, where are my bells? Yeah, here we go. And then the LA2A for more, uh, uh like, I use the LA2A for more held notes. Um like the pads and stuff and it also yeah i use the cl1b for the bell sorry i mean the la2a sort of imparted a certain warmth for want of a better word to my signal and i used that whenever i felt the sound needed some warmth um i think for the guitar sounds i used uh, a fairchild um on the input not quite sure and the profit, I'm pretty sure I used the Fairchild or the LA2A. So it was things like that, like 1073 into a into one of those four or five compressors. And that's the instrumental. And then I printed it um, with, with that plugin chain. And then uh, the resultant tracks are what you see here. Let's just quickly, I realize now I forgot to go through the background vocals. Um, the background vocals were pretty much the same, uh, the same process as the main vocal, the lead vocal. Like I, I would have recorded a bunch of takes. Yep. And then comped it and then shifted the clips in time. Um, I didn't use elastic audio because it's just, um, I was just singing long held notes. Um, so that was that uh yeah i had 
somewhat of a harmony going. There were one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight tracks. Um, I ran it through. Let's have a look at my typical hard like anal analog plug-in chain for the background vocals. Where are they? Here they are. Yeah, 1073 seal one B and then what have I got here? Oh, uh, the filter. Yeah, the pull tech filter. Um, Cause I wanted to filter out the highs and the lows from them to shape the sound that way. And then uh, while we're on the background vocals, uh, as you can see, I printed that through the analog plugin chain and, and they're on these tracks here. So those are my eight tracks. Um, and then from there, I've got the Pro Q3 filtering some more, cutting some, some mud. Pro C2 doing some soft, but very squashy in terms of time constant, two to one ratio compression. Uh, and then I've got the vocal doubler from Isotope. Now this is my first time using this again, but I really needed something that uh, was gonna thicken up the sound of the background vocals. It wasn't enough to just play with the panning of them. Like I needed something else. So I reached for that one. Um, so those are my background vocals done. And then as with the background vocals, after I printed all the other sounds through the analog, uh, sort of analog style plugins, I um, put them through the Fab Filter Pro Q3 and the Pro C2. So here I've got my vocals, my lead vocal. I've got a I've got a high pass filter, 60 hertz with a Q of 0 0.5, at a slope of 48 decibels per octave, and I'm cutting a bit more nasality out, um, more than I already did with the with the other hardware emulation plugins. Sorry, it's getting a bit dark, so I'm gonna turn the room light on. One second. Well, sorry for that sudden burst of light. All right, um, yeah, so that's that. And then my lead vocal is also going through this Vox comp. Uh, it's just their vocal setting. I've tweaked with the attack and release. I generally like super, super fast attack and super, super slow release if I, can, if I can get away with it. Like if the compressor is clean enough, then I like to really make sure that it's more or less squashed. And I make sure that um, there's a decent amount of look ahead. Um, yeah. For it to, to catch everything. And I've got oversampling on as well. Just because this is the main vocal sound. I don't want any aliasing distortion because it's going to be most noticeable and most damaging on a lead vocal sound. Then I got the Pro DS by Fab Filter, which is great all around DSR. I have the range set really massively and the threshold to minus infinity because I want to catch all the S's and all the ch -ch -ch -ch, those sounds. Um, and I apologize in advance that I don't have any DSing on my current mic. I'm not running this through any through any plugin, so I have no control over the processing. It's just straight from the, the mic to the interface to this video. So apologies for that. Then I've got the vocal doubler on the lead vocal. I was tossing up whether to use this or not. Eventually I decided to use it. Here are my settings. As you can see, separation 50%, variation 20%. I, I believe this amount is a mix knob, uh, but then if you set this to a hundred and you have this button off, and then if you set it, and then if you turn this button on, they sound different. So I'm not entirely convinced this is a mix knob, but like purely a mix knob, maybe it's a mix knob with something else because then what, what does this effect only thing do? Anyway, like I've got this to 50%. So 50, 20, 50. Now I did that with all the other, as you can see here, I've got the Pro Q3 and the Pro C2 on all the other sounds. I'm high passing uh, pretty much everything. 
um, yeah, pretty much everything except the sounds that have low end, like I'm not high passing the 808. Um, but, but yeah, certainly everything else is high passed. And then from there, um, I had to, I, and I learned this the hard way, right? So the analog, the analog plugin chains, let me just pull up one for an, for an example while we talk about it. Um, what's a good one to do? Let's just do the vocal one. I'm gonna pull up the main vocal, the chorus vocal uh, track, all right? That um, chorus vocal track. There it is right there, okay? Here is a, is a volume indicator in Pro Tools. It tells you, I think it tells you the peak uh, level of the sound. You can see it says minus 66.7. Now, if you look at this, there's nothing there. So there's no sound. I haven't hit spacebar on this session at all throughout this entire video. Um, Cause I told you before, like, I haven't been able to work out how to route the audio from Pro Tools into this video. Um, but yeah, if I were to hit spacebar onto, on the session, you'd see all these numbers come up on the bot, uh, on the right hand side of this, this kind of indicator here. Like you see two different numbers. Um, and this will be the peak over here will be the peak level of this track, which is high pads. This is a pre fader peak level, right? Over here, you see minus 66.7, which means that there is currently a signal whose peak level is minus 66.7 decibels going through this track right now. What that is, is the noise that is coming out of these plugins that are modeling analog gear. So we got the seven, 1073, we got the CL1B, the black box, the EQP1A pull tech and the, and the pull tech MEQ5. So these five plugins are outputting some noise and combined in combination, the peak of the noise that's being outputted by these plugins is minus 66.7 decibels. I, I didn't, I didn't grasp how significant this would be until I was mixing this entire project, having printed through these plugins onto, onto these individual tracks here. Um, and put the, you know, the fab filter plugins in and tried to do a mix. Like I didn't grasp the importance of that. Um, until out in the mixing phase. And I was listening back onto the track thinking like, why am I hearing it to be so grainy and distorted? And I was second guessing myself, wondering whether I had just saturate, oversaturated everything, whether I had um, just put black box on everything and maybe I shouldn't have put black box on everything, you know, but I realized that a large, a, a major contributing factor to that grainy, saturated, high-end noise I was hearing was just the, the noise that was outputted by these analog plugins um, that had been baked into the audio. So then what I had to do was use the strip silence um, tool. I think it's control U on Windows, but yeah, yeah, control U. So I used the strip silence thing, right? And I, and I went ahead and I stripped the silence. Uh, I set, I set this to whatever threshold. I think that, yeah, the noise was minus 66.7. So I set it to, um, to maybe like, I don't know, just above that. Um, and then played around with the strip duration and then the padding. Uh, I had it at 10 milliseconds actually start and end. And then I stripped the silence and then I faded, I faded in and out over the 10 milliseconds. 
uh, to get rid of the noise. And I did that for every single track and it took me a while and it was annoying to do. Uh, but I did it uh, and the results were night and day. Like I wasn't hearing that graininess, that high end noise that could have just been distortion. Um, yeah, it was really night and day and and it was a lot better. It wasn't, the noise was was uh, building up to a point where it was getting in the way and you could hear it even when other other sounds were playing. So I really had to do something to get rid of it. And then um, after that, I went ahead and balanced the levels. I ran through the mix. I, I like to work through this really quickly in terms of moving the faders up and down. I'm using a mouse only, which is kind of, it, it takes a little bit longer and is a little less tactile, a little less enjoyable to do, but I balanced the levels. Um, yeah, and then I added uh, effects. Let's have a look at the effects bus I've got here. So we got, um, yeah, right, okay. I remember this now. Uh, I used, I just stacked on a lot of effects that I normally wouldn't have used, you know, like, um, got, uh, okay. I'll tell you the, I'll, I'll tell you which ones I would and wouldn't use normally. Got the chorus, which is essential for your pad sound to sound creamy. Um, and, uh, you know, fuller and to widen the stereo image a little bit. Uh, and that is the Tal chorus LX, which the guy from Tal took from his emulation of, of a Juno. This thing is awesome. It's free and it's awesome. It is the chorus sound that I was always looking for. And I'll talk about this plugin a lot more um, in, a, in a video to come later. But I really, really love this plugin. And I think it's probably the one and only chorus that I will ever use. So I've got that running. Dry wet knob to maximum wet, stereo width to maximum. I've got it normally on setting one only. If I want it to be super creamy, I'll just put one and two together. But I generally don't like two. I generally just like one because it's a lot more subtle. Then I've got the Valhalla delay. Uh, I've got, I don't know. This is a short delay. Feedback to nothing. Just a, a single tap, like a one tap delay. Mix to 100 again on sync to notes 1 one sixty fourth, which is a demi demi semi quaver. Then I've got a longer delay, which is just a stereo delay. Feedback to nothing again, just two taps, one on each side, at different times, as you can see. Then what I've got here, um, yeah, many taps. I've got a I've got a couple of taps, four taps already here, and then we've got some 50% feedback. Uh, this is like a, an echo sound, I suppose. I've called this scent echoes. Now I've got ambience, Valhalla room. As you can see, I'm a big fan of Valhalla DSP. Their plugins are cheap, but really good. Like all of them are like 50 US dollars. And they, they're really good. Like they're used by the pros. So I've got this sort of um, small room, the small bright room reverb, just to add some ambience. Plate verb, this is the, the Universal Audio Pure Plate. One that I got for free that I that I mentioned before. I didn't really like it. But like today, I mean, for this session, for this song, as I said, I, I was just trying everything. I was just putting everything on, seeing what worked. So I chucked this on, it was on a send, so it didn't cost much in terms of CPU power. Then I got the piano verb. This is the PSP free version of the piano verb. And apparently what this is, is they run, they make the reverb sound like it's been run through a, a piano. And this I find adds some depth and texture to any piano tracks. So for, for any piano track that I have, like, you know, I've got a piano track in this song, I will run it through a send and I will send it to this PSP piano verb because it makes it sound more like a piano, you know? And then I've got this um this spring reverb by Hornet Mola. I don't know, there was some promotion, there was some 
promotion about this where you if you sign up to their newsletter or some crap you you get this free plugin it's a spring reverb i tried it and it was like the only spring reverb that i had that isn't the air stock one so i got it but i i don't like this i to be honest i don't like the sound of it so i use very very little like i'm sending very very little of it to the spring reverb this is my send right here like when this is playing when the bus is playing like you'll be able to see there's a there's a small amount of level that's going to this um spring reverb because i just didn't like it this is the uh l lx480 essentials by relab development uh, i got this for free again um it came with my universal audio vault I was like, okay, the 480 is very, very famous. I'll try it out. So I've got two. Oh no, I don't have the long reverb by um, Valhalla. Normally I would have Valhalla's like a longer reverb. Uh, I, I think a chamber emulation reverb by Valhalla. But for this song, I went with the 480 and just wanted to see how it, it sounds. It does sound different. To me, it sounds a bit more digital and a bit more uh, like a uh, bit more bright uh, but then again you know you can tweak the eq for the valhalla um so it's irrelevant how bright it sounds um relative to the lexi 480 and after that i've got some a pro, an instance of pro q3 and I, I've made a preset called Eric's MS FX Shaper. And what it is is just a mid side EQ, um, cutting the, the mids and the, the mids and the sides, the low end, cutting a bit more of the sides than the mids, boosting the sides top end, cutting the mids top end as well. And from both the mid and the side, like I've got a stereo bell filter cutting uh, about 6 dB at three kilohertz. That's just to give some space to the main instruments, whether it be vocals or something else. So, so those are my effects and I use effects through sends um, to save CPU power. And I find it, it's a lot more elegant to do it that way. Oh my God, that light is crazy. Sorry about the light guys. And if you've stuck it out to this point in the video, I just wanted to say thank you for watching so long into the video. I don't know how long I've been recording for. Uh, one hour and like 45 minutes so thank you thank you so much for watching um we're almost there all right so from there what i did um after i added the effects sends and i added all these uh um you know effects sorry i've got the order mix up actually i've i created the sends right then i went ahead and i routed all my tracks to buses the or buses or subgroups, same thing, as you can see here. Let me move me out of the way. Here are the Vox bus, the BG Vox. Oh, no, I'll tell you what, I'll just go here. It's the Vox bus, the uh, BG Vox bus, pads bus, keys bus, guitar bus, and drum bus. This is the first time I'm, I'm actually working like this. Uh, sorry, there's a, there's a baby crying in the background. Um, this is the first time I'm working like this. Um, I typically don't work with buses or, or subgroups like this. Um, I normally just leave the tracks as they are and I move the faders up and down if I wanted to rebalance. But again, for this song, I thought I'd try something new and um, route everything to a bus and then process them. Uh, through a bus. I saw a video about like top down mixing versus bottom up and top down is just working with buses and subgroups and, and processing the buses and subgroups as they are. And bottom up is the opposite, like working from the individual tracks and processing them that way. I decided to, to do both because I believe in the bottom up approach. Like I think for EQ, especially uh, surgical EQ, you really have to you really have to listen to the track itself and affect the track with that EQ by itself.
to make sure you you get the frequencies right whether you cut the problem frequencies that you need to from that individual track or you boost the the the, the, the desired frequencies of that track individually like in, instead of applying a blanket eq to a whole bunch of tracks just one instance yeah i think the bottom up approach is better um, it, although you can, you know, you can apply an EQ to a whole bunch of tracks if you're routing everything through a bus and you've got the EQ on the bus. Um, but yeah, I don't like it that way. It's it's a bit too imprecise and a bit too sloppy for my taste. Now with compression, you need to compress every single individual track um, because if you can't you can't just like do it in a in a bus because all the all the different individual elements of that bus have different dynamic signatures and they will hit the threshold differently and they'll, they'll uh, trigger the compressor and the compressor will, will react differently to um, all those different sounds so you must compress every single track individually if you're going to compress the track at all um, yeah, so as you can see, I've done that individually. We, we took a bottom-up approach. And then I routed it to these light purple tracks up here, which are my, my subgroups, my sorry, my buses. And then I've got some further processing. I was originally only going to use compression on these buses as glue, not not to control dynamics and not to shape transients excuse me, but just as glue, to glue everything together to make sure each bus was cohesive. But I needed to do some more processing with EQ on it. Um, especially filters, because I found that it just wasn't really, it wasn't working right. It wasn't doing, it wasn't sounding the way I wanted to, so I needed to shape it further. And my philosophy with this was, uh, you know, on the bottom up approach to be more surgical, I'd use the digital sort of clean EQs and compressors, which are the Fab Filter Pro Q3 and the Fab Filter Pro, Pro C2. And then for the buses, the processing, I can just use, um, I can just use analog ones to, to give it that kind of flavor again. Um, so we've got up here for my vocals, I got the, Soft tube uh, CL1B again, then we're going through the EQP1A, the pull tech. Um, then we're going through some filters. I don't know why I filtered so much. Uh, maybe I shouldn't have. And then that was adding a lot of sibilance. Like I was running into a problem where everything was really, really sibilant on the, on the Vox, on the vocal bus. And when you were hearing it back in the mix for the mix down and eventually the master, you could really hear the, the sibilant sounds. Uh, and, and I was having a hard time compromising and, and balancing between boosting the high end on the, on the mix bus, which is what I felt the mix needed because it was very dark versus when you do that, you boost a lot of sibilants. So I had a hard time adjusting this sibilance and eventually I got this range to be 9 dB. Um, alongside another 9 dB range for my individual vocal tracks. So it's going through like in total across everything, 18 decibels of, of gain reduction for the, for the S sounds. And then here I've got this um, this steep two filters at 303,000 hertz, which is supposed to emulate like a telephone sound. I've got this automator to be on because uh, while I was making this song, I decided I would have uh, the chorus um, to be the introduction. And I wanted it to sound different to the to the rest of the vocals, like the verse vocals. So I decided to heavily filter it with this. And I like it, like, you know, the frequency range opens up spectacularly when, when you get to, to bar nine, because 
uh, the intro just has the pads, the piano support pad sound, as you can see, like you can see by the arrangement. It's just the chorus vocal that's been filtered, the piano support pad sound, and the background vocals here. That's all there is. And if you remember from before, the background vocals have already been filtered quite heavily when, when I was sculpting the sounds. So the frequency range opens up spectacularly when the filters for the lead vox, lead vocals are bypassed at verse one and then all these other instruments are added. Um, yeah, so that this, these are my buses, the plugin chains for my buses. Got, uh, what's this, the background vocals. I got the Rev A for the background vocals and then into a 2A um, for the compressor, then the mag EQ4. Oh, I don't know why I'm boosting nine here for the air band, uh, and then cutting like 160. Uh, I generally, okay, with this EQ, and I'll talk about it maybe in another video. Uh, I only ever really use two bands, and that's the air band, which is, I think, what everyone buys this plugin for is this air band. I set it to 40k and I boost it. And then this band, this red one, which is 160 hertz bell filter. And I usually cut that. Now with the air band, I've done a few songs since this one. And generally what I'll do is, is not go above five. So I don't know what I was thinking boosting nine here. Um, and then cutting four, like I generally wouldn't cut more than 1.5 here. Otherwise, otherwise it sounds really, sounds really thin. Uh, so I don't know. As I said, like, as I keep saying in this video, this song was just a learning curve for me. I was just learning how to do stuff here. So I was just mocking around. I've learned the lesson since then not to boost this much air. Like I seriously, now that I see this, I don't know what I was thinking because I had already cut most of those frequencies out when I was shaping these sounds. So yeah. And then again here, I, uh, as you can see, I'm filtering out 15K. So I don't know what I was doing, you know. I don't know how much of that mag EQ4's air band actually did in the end when I'm filtering out 15K anyway. Anyway, so that's that. Here we got the pads bus, super simple. We just got a 2A there and an EQP1A. I'm pretty sure I boosted the low end. No, I didn't. Oh my God. Boosted the high end here. That's weird. <laughs> As I said, like I've done a few songs since then and I, would, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't use the EQP1A for this purpose. You know, uh, this plugin really is to do low end. It's not really for high end. So I, I surprised myself that there's nothing here. Um, if I wanted high end, I would reach for something else like the mag EQ4, but I, I don't know. Maybe it just gave, like running through these plugins, it does give a certain warmth. Like it emulates the entire circuit. Like it goes through those tubes and stuff like that. So maybe that's the difference. Maybe that's what I was thinking. Um, it's pads, keys. Uh, CL1B. Uh, the keys bus has a whole bunch of stuff going to it. It's not just keys. It's got it's got some other stuff. Let's have a look. Okay, the profits going through it. The piano, the EP, the electric piano is going through it. We're looking at bus 15 to 16, by the way. So this one here. Um, is there anything else? Uh, no, nah, that's it. So what do we got? Keys, CL1B. Um, I mean, yeah, typical uh, ratio of two to one. I'll be going for again, two to three decibels of gain reduction. Then we've got the mid, um, the mid frequencies pull tech. I don't know what, oh, dipping 3K. Okay, okay. That makes sense. I would have been wanting to make space for the vocal there. Um, Guitar bus. Now, uh, the bells are going through this as well, I think. So this is going, this is, uh, uh, what is it? Bus 17 to 18. 
So the bells are going through that as well, alongside the acoustic and electric guitar by MIDI. I don't think there's anything else through it. Yeah, there's nothing else through it. So yeah, I've got the Fairchild 660. I wanted, I wanted like a really girthy tube compressor, like something that was gonna add weight and and thickness and and warmth. I hate that word, but that's kind of what I was looking for. And I settled on the Fairchild. Um, yeah, because it, it does add some color to it. And I, you can see that I pushed it. I think I pushed it quite a bit because the signal was really low. But again, I'm going for about three decibels of gain reduction. And I don't think I have the side part, side chain filter on, which uh, maybe next time if I was using this, I would do it. Then it's going through the Mag EQ4. I wanted some brightness. Um, I wanted some brightness for the for the guitar sounds especially the electric guitar midi um then i'm cutting a shelf um at 2.5k to make way for the vocal now i'm i think at the time i thought this was a bell filter i didn't realize it was a shelf but maybe i wouldn't have done it like this i would have used a different plugin with a bell filter for it because then you're like pushing with the air band and then pulling with this um orange band here i don't know then I'm filtering it again because it's adding some some frequencies above and below what I want. Um, but yeah, that's the guitar. Now the drum bus, AP5, API 2500, which is more or less the only thing I would use this plugin for would be a drum bus. It's, it's pretty much useless in that sense. Uh, but here it is. Uh, Feed forward, uh, medium kind of knee setting, and I've got the loud, which is their side chain, side chain filter. As you can see, it's emphasizing the high frequencies and de-emphasizing the low frequencies when you are, um, when you are, are triggering the compressor. This is the only time I use anything except for a two to one ratio. I had a hard time adjusting this to make it sound good. Like I was either getting too much compression or too little, and then my bus was peaking over zero decibels, which was, which was, uh, causing annoyances. Um, but yeah, this is just the drum sound, you know, the hi hat, the snare clap, the 808 was going through it. That's pretty much um, the drum bus. Then I got the EQP one A, which, yes, I did boost the low frequencies, which is exactly what this is for. Um, at a hundred, uh, boosting five, cutting at five, really tightening up that low shelf filter. And I also boost a little bit of highs as well with a broad cue. I only ever use a broad cue when I'm boosting with these kinds of plugins. Cause I want like, I want musicality. I don't want the harshness and you can only go if you have like a, a, a sort of a super, super, um, steep cue or i mean steep slope or or a narrow cue uh, it, it sounds it sounds really really shrill and harsh really quickly so i keep it really really broad cue wise and i generally don't boost a lot um yeah although with this pull tech you can really boost it and it and it won't do that much it won't do that much damage and then I'm dipping about 700 to cut some mud and some boxiness, peaking some 4K. Uh, yeah, and that's that's it with the MEQ5. And uh, with the buses, that's when I sent it to the effects sends. Um, so yeah, I did it like that. Short delay, ambience, echoes, and, and a little bit of plate um, and some reverb for the vocal bus, then for the pad, the, uh, sorry, the background vocals, chorus, uh, some of the, the room, ambience, echoes, uh, plate verb again, only a little bit of plate verb, um, and some reverb from the Lexi. Then these are the pads, the chorus, you can see right there, pretty straightforward, chorus and some ambience and some reverb. 
keys uh, chorus and a little bit of a little bit of these echoes like a the tiniest amount of delay of those kind of the, the echoey delay that we talked about earlier the guitar bass a little bit of chorus some ambience uh, longer delay just it's just a two tap stereo delay no feedback spring reverb a tiny tiny bit because i hated the sound i hated the sound it's just there to, to add a little bit of dimension that like when you take it off you'll you'll notice that something's not there but when you put it in you don't even know what it what it, what it is that it, that's there you know then some reverb um and then drum bass ambience and, and reverb ambience and reverb on everything very very important a different obviously different levels to, according to the um a material let's just see if i added some ambience to the snare i didn't okay so one of the reasons i don't generally like using buses uh is the complication with sends so if i'm going to route something to a bus and then i'm going to put processing on that bus uh obviously that processing is going to change the way each of the individual components of that bus sound and so it would make sense that i would put the sends to my effects at you know from the bus not the individual tracks because the chain would go the individual tracks to the bus and it's processing and then you want that process sound to be sent to the to the effects um but that kind of ties you up in that you'll you'll run into compromises when you want to say for example if you have a drum bus and you put some reverb on the drum bus but you want a little bit more reverb on the snare if you go and uh put the send on the individual snare track to crank up the, the reverb send level a bit more than you would on the bus then the snare the the snare reverb like the signal that's being sent from the snare reverb track is going to be different from the snare that as it sounds on the on the drum bus because the drum bus has had additional processing on the snare and and the other drums as well that you haven't had on the signal that's being sent to um the 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 snare reverb so yeah i mean i would have wanted some more some more uh reverb on the snare sound um relative to the other sounds on the drum bus but because i was doing this mixing approach and trying this out i, I decided it wasn't i wasn't okay to do that because you know the snare would sound different and then i don't even know about phase issues like i don't know if it's going to cause issues uh with with phase that you've got multiple different snare sounds that are processed differently uh you've got the snare sound that's going through the bus and then the return from the drum bus reverb sand and then you've got the return from the snare reverb sand so yeah I decided not to overcomplicate things and uh, sorry overcomplicate things and and uh, I just stuck with putting the the effects sends on the buses. Um, so from there, what I did was I routed the output of each of the buses. So remember, um, all the sounds have been all the individual tracks have been routed to their respective buses and then i'm gonna i routed the output of each of these buses uh to my bus three and four as you can see here all these individual uh buses are routed to bus three and four which is this orange mix bus here let me see if, um i'm gonna drag this over over here so it's more in the middle uh, this is my mix bus. Uh, I just called it my mix bus. It's kind of quite arbitrary. Um, but I've got the EQP1A on the mix bus. Now remember, this like obviously mix bus is like all the sounds 
going through this boss. We got the pull tech EQP one egg and I'm boosting and attenuating 100 hertz, really tightening up the, the bottom end. Um, boosting quite a bit of the high frequencies here at 10K with a broad Q. Mag EQ again, boosting the um, upper mids and the, and the high end. Because as I mentioned before, when I was listening to this in the mix down, it sounded really, really dark like super super dark so i had to keep on cranking the high end but here here is an example of an eq where if you crank too much it's gonna sound like crap so if i went further than three this with this orange uh upper mid shelf it would sound really 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 harsh like the jump from it sounding smooth and nice to suddenly sounding harsh is literally just one 0.5 step. Uh, so I really took it with a limit with this one. And um, yeah, same as this. If I crank this further than three o'clock, further than this, um, you know, eight position, it would sound really, really harsh and really, really brittle. And I think it has something to do with the fact that uh, these analog plug, analog hardware systems, which these plugins are emulating, the more you, you boost or cut of a frequency, the greater the, the Q factor increases. So the more you boost and cut, the narrower the Q will get. And, the ste and if it's a shelf, the steeper the slope it will get. So the most sort of, the, in my opinion, the best way to use these plugins is to, to be super, super gentle with it and just boost a little, little bit so that you have a, a very uh, gradual, uh, gradual sort of slope, not steep. What's the opposite of steep? You know what I mean? Like not steep slope, like a, 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 a I don't know, as as level as, as possible, like, a, like a, a very gradual slope um, for the shell filters. And then like a, a, a kind of wider Q wider Q uh, boost or cut for the bell filters instead of like a narrow one where it just sounds really wacky like on these on these plugins so I wouldn't wouldn't recommend uh, I especially wouldn't recommend doing like any surgical EQ work with these it's not going to work very well then I've got this uh oh this is this was a good one I <laughs> I tell you the story right so i had been wanting to get this um, SSL bus compressor. I imagine this is based on the G series console bus compressor that everybody loves um, and is renowned for its glue. I've wanted to get this for so long. And then one day I looked at the actual SSL native website and they were having this crazy sale. This, is, this was normally like 329 US, US dollars. And then they were selling it for like 29 US dollars. So this is like a $300 saving. So I nabbed it and it, and yeah, I mean, it works. I have the high pass filter side chain set to 150. So quite a lot of the low end is being cut out of the, of the triggering circuit. Cause I want that, that bottom end to really pop out. Um, and yeah, just going for maybe like four dB gain reduction maximum, got oversampling at two times. Uh, this is supposed to glue the mix together. I, it did something. I'm not sure I would describe the effect as glue, but it did something where if you turned it off, like you noticed that it wasn't there. And, and then again, I'm running this through the black box Seriously, man, you guys, I mean, you guys can put this on anything and just put the the parallel saturation circuit in, leave everything at its default settings and then just leave it. I've got some air engaged as well because again, it, it was very, very dark, this mix. It was super dark. Then I got this um, soft tube tape plugin. Uh, now... <sighs> I got this, uh, I don't know if was, I'm pretty sure it was on sale, but it's, if not, it's normally 99 bucks. They say that this plugin is very light on CPU 
And indeed, if you whack this on a track, the delay compensation is only four samples compared to say a fab filter satin, which puts a lot more, like hundreds of samples of delay compensation. And therefore you can extrapolate from that, that it's using a lot of CPU power. They say this soft tube tape plugin is very CPU light, but I swear every single time I open up, open it up, there's a huge lag and it takes ages. It must be the GUI or something uh, that is really eating my CPU. But I've got the, the tape speed to 30 inches per second. Let me just move me, move me out of the way. I've got the tape speed to 30 inches per second. I've got the amount at its default, which is at 12 o'clock, this five out of 10. I'm using the A setting. I've got the level to show me the total harmonic distortion. Over this control panel, the dry wet control is at 100% wet. I've made it completely stable. I don't want any of the, the wobbliness, like the, the wow, the flutter from tape emulations. I'm not interested in that, nor am I interested in noise. Um, the high frequencies trim, I've got it at flat. I'm literally just using it for a little bit of um, tape harmonic distortion. And it's very, very little. Like if I played this, this meter will hardly move. And that's what I'm using it for. Um, I had tried the Universal Audio Studio A800. It just didn't work for me. It was very CPU hungry. It um, was the, the, the GUI, the GUI was very complicated and I couldn't work out what was what. So I just gave it a miss and I bought this tape instead and I love it. Like it's, it's what I want. I'm not looking for, I'm not looking for a plugin that you know that, you know, you're running, you're running through tape. I'm not looking for that. I just want something really, really subtle that gives a very subtle amount of, of harmonic distortion and a very subtle change in my EQ, EQ frequencies. So um, that's my mix bus. And again, this is like uh, the philosophy of doing things like uh, as if it was an analog system. So this is my analog mix bus. It's got the, the pool tech the mag eq the ssl g series bus comp emulation the black box and a tape machine and then from there i'm routing that to my bus one and two which is my master bus this is just name only like they're just literally they're literally the same it's there's no difference between a mix bus and a master bus because it's the same signal that's been anyway running through both of them um so up here, as you can see, let me move myself out of the way. Uh, up here, as you can see, I've got some fab filter prop plugins, got the Pro Q3, Pro C2, the Sooth 2 again, got the Sir Audio Tools standard clip and the fab filter Pro L. So with the Pro Q3, this looks like a mess, I know. I know. It's a mess to me too, but this is what this is my kind of idea behind it. What I wanted to do is um, have a plugin that is doing all of my EQ work and just keep it at like one plugin. So I've got all these dynamic EQ bands that are uh, gently attenuating when frequencies reach a certain threshold. And then this is in stereo mode. So it's attenuating both the left and right um, by itself. I mean, together. And then I've got some mid side EQ happening. With the mids, I'm cutting 1K and I'm boosting. I'm boosting the same frequency 6 dB for the side channel. And that's just to give some stereo separation. And generally speaking, 1000 Hertz doesn't sound very good on a lot of things. Like most things you want to cut 1000 Hertz from, um, sides, I'm cutting three K six DB. And then I've got a shelf at three K starting at three K 
boosting six decibels for the mid. And I'm also boosting, uh, got a high shelf at 6 dB for my side channel to boost the highs of the side channel. I've got a steep-ish high pass filter for um, the side channel at 200 Hertz. Q 0.5, as you can see, a slope of 48 decibels per octave. And then I've got this stereo instance of a 20 Hertz brick wall high pass filter. And, and it's hard to notice this being here, but everything just sort of tightens up and cleans up with it there. Initially, I was very worried about the phase issues that this would impart if you have such a steep filter, but I just, I just needed it there because it was, um, yeah, it, it cleaned things up, tightened it up and gave me a lot more headroom to work with. Pro C2, uh, my philosophy, as I said before, with the, with the cleaner plugins, especially the FabFilter Pro C plugins, which are super, super clean, really fast attack, really slow release. Got some, I think I have some oversampling on. Yeah, you can just barely see it there. It's two times oversampling. Got some look ahead on as well. Um, side chain engaged at 48 decibels uh, per octave at 150 hertz, filtering out the lows from the triggering. Uh, circuit two to one ratio what I end up getting is about 27 decibels of, of gain reduction that's because the threshold is set at minus 60 I'm really really grabbing a lot of that information and pumping it down and that's how I like to glue things together um, mid side compression on the fab filter pro C is a chain is, is a pain uh, you can't actually really do it. You have to run two plugins, uh, one after the other, two instances, one after the other. So I'll just keep this in stereo, like whatever. Um, Sooth 2, again. Yeah, so this is doing a lot of DSing on the master because I boost a lot of high end because of how dark the, um, how dark the, uh, uh, the mix was. So that boosted a lot of the, the sibilance in my in my vocal. So I had to to cut a lot of that and I really pushed this to the limit. I turned this up to 10. So what I did and what a lot of people normally do is they boost it until they hear that it's making it worse. And then they back it off just enough for, you know, the bad stuff to go away and you just have the, like you maximize the good stuff, right? Um, so <laughs> too much of a good thing is a bad thing, but then you dial it back and then you have the maximum good goodness. And that's, that's it there. Next in the chain, we've got our Sir Audio Tool Standard Clip. Guys, this is, this is by far the best Clipper plugin ever. It's very, very old. The, the GUI is very, very dated. And there are lots of things that I wish they would do to make it easier to use. Um, but it's still the best sounding one. And it gives you, it, it has this lovely meter here. Uh, I think it's, is it called an oscilloscope or, or something? I think it's called an oscilloscope. Or a vector scope, but I think vector scope is for the stereo field. I think it's oscilloscope. And then you can set it to output plus reduction. I set it to full so you can see like the, you know, both halves of the waveform. And the output plus reduction, it shows the, the output signal in white and the reduction, like the clipped parts, clipped off parts in red. So you can see the original waveform, um, which is the red plus white. And then you can see how, you know, how the peaks have really been managed and, and clipped down, clipped off. And I really like seeing that. But the thing is with this, and I, I suspect with all clippers, you cannot abuse it. Like you should go maximum two and a half to three dB of gain reduction like clipping the peaks by two and a half or three dB. If you go more than that, you are definitely going to hear some artifacts and they're not pleasant sounding artifacts. For example, like if you have a sound that has a really big transient in your left channel, right? 
and then the clipper clips off like six decibels of that sound from the left channel, you're gonna hear artifacts. You're gonna hear distortion, but you're gonna hear distortion across the entire stereo field. So if you're listening back on it, you'll hear that when that sound, that transient gets clipped on the left channel, you also get distortion on, on, on the right channel. Um, but that's not the, the main reason. Like the main reason you don't wanna abuse this is you don't want the distortion at all. So I generally like to clip only like 1.5 decibels using this clipper. And that way I think is the, is the best way to use this. This is more or less like a limiter before the limiter anyway. So I'll go into more detail about this plugin later, but, but just quickly, one of the things um, I really wish they would have done before would be to give us a meter that shows the difference between the input and the output signal after the clipping. As it stands, what you have to do is look at the left here, the left side of the plugin, uh, max peak level, and then you get the difference between that and the right side of the plugin max peak level. So the left side is the input and the right side is the output. Then you have to manually subtract the bigger one from the smaller one to get the difference to see how much you've clipped off. Um, and that's, that's annoying. I wish they would just show us that. But other than that, I'd still use it. And, and you only really have to do that math not very many times. Next, we've got the Fab Filter Pro L. Um, I've got oversampling on two times. Did it off because I'm keeping this uh, song at 24 bits, which is the session uh, that it was set up in. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, again, I'm, I'm looking for like maximum three to four decibels of gain reduction for this one. This is a lot cleaner than the stand, the, the, the clipper. You're not gonna get very noticeable artifacts um, on the on the Pro L2. It's it's better designed that way, but too much of it, of the transient being chopped off by this limiter is not a good thing. So yeah, I like to keep it generally around two to three decibels of gain reduction up here. And this does show you in a nice number how much gain reduction is there. Laughs, in terms of laughs, I've got this set to integrated laughs. Um, look, uh, I don't really care for the loudness war, but I, I do know that it is, um, you know, different services are gonna want different things. And if you, if you have things too soft, that they're gonna crank the volume and then limit it for you. And I wouldn't want them to do that because I don't have control over how much they limit it and how much gain reduction they apply to the peaks uh, because that will introduce distortion. Uh, so I'd like to have that control myself. And as a result, I need to make it loud enough that they won't turn it up. So that runs the risk of them turning it down. So if that's the case, then whatever. So that's the digital master bus. That's pretty much everything apart from the fact that uh, when I was mixing, I realized that these buses were adding some noise as you can see here down the bottom bottom left, uh, sorry, bottom right of these meters is adding a, a whole lot of um, whole, whole lot of signal uh, because we've got these analog style plugins. Uh, so these, um, yeah all this added together is adding some is adding some noise to the signal so i went ahead and i automated some muting um some of them i could mute the entire bus like the background vocals i can mute see how here is muted uh when the when there's no uh, background vocal playing there's no background vocal there in the verses, so I've just muted the whole bus, so it's not outputting that noise from the plugins that are on this bus. Um, others, I had to do a combination of automating the mutes for the bus, as well as the individual tracks that make up the bus, because sometimes, for example, like um, here you can see, 
the acoustic guitar is playing for verse one and then in chorus, the electric guitar joins and then stays throughout. So I couldn't just like mute the guitar bus uh, until the chorus when both of these guitars are here because the acoustic guitar comes in at the verse, at the first verse. So there's that. And then uh, my mix bus, I automated a fade. Um, yeah, I don't know why I did that for the mix bus. I should have done it for the master bus. Because then the fade is, you know, making this, this affecting this compression. So yeah, that was an oversight. Maybe I should have done it for the master bus instead. Uh, yeah. So yeah, that's pretty much how I made this song. Um, it's been, wow, it's been two and a half hours. I might just quickly talk, of, my voice is like really trash, like my throat's really dry. I really wanna, wanna have a drink, but I don't wanna leave you guys. <laughs> and then go get some water and come back and waste your time. So I might just uh, finish this off really quickly before I go get a drink. I wanted to talk a little bit about my reflection after having made this song in the way I did and, and, you know, uh, running with the, um, running with the decisions I made, uh, when I was making this song. So, uh, first of all, to, to be honest, I realize now my vocal is way too distorted. I cranked up that line level input on the 1073 to the max because I thought more saturation is better um, on the 1073 but uh, nah like it's not it's not it's not good and um, it doesn't sound good to me and and yeah if I could do this again I wouldn't have done it that way it got to a stage where like I knew that it was too distorted and I had already printed it I couldn't just reprint it because I ran it through the vocal, the the plugins, um, the 1073, the CL1B and all the rest of it. And then I tuned it with auto-tune. And I didn't want to do all that work again. I didn't wanna run it through plugins again and then have to, and to use auto-tune to retune it again and, and process it as I did afterwards after the, the analog plugins like i didn't want to do it so um yeah if i was to do this again i would have actually used autotune before running it through those analog emulation plugins so that way i have more flexibility in terms of changing the settings of those plugins around and also i would just avoid the problem in the first place and not crank up that 1073 preamp as much as i did back then um yeah the whole yeah um the whole mix is is actually really distorted i did use a black box on a lot of the tracks um, i believe every single track except for the pad sound maybe i would if i was to do this again i would only use the black box um to saturate the tracks like the main tracks i'm talking about the drums the vocal any like main instruments and not absolutely everything because the whole thing just sounded way too crunchy too distorted and uh yeah i wouldn't i wouldn't have done it i wouldn't do it again like that um yeah uh what else see i wrote this down i'm just looking at my notes Yeah, oh yeah, I mentioned this before. I would have switched the 1073 insert on my main vocal to the mic one and then just padded the input because I've tried it since then and it sounds a lot better than using the line input. Um, it has a different kind of uh, saturation. It has a much warmer saturation. Maybe that's the difference, you know. Maybe that's the difference in in the vocal being way too distorted and uh, what it is now, I don't know. Um, yeah, but uh, you know, at the time I didn't know that that was an option. I didn't know that's what, you know, it sounds better. Um, 
So yeah, you're living your life. Um, okay, yeah, that's pretty much it. That's my reflection. Um, yeah, so if I was to do this again, I'll, I'll, I'll do those. I'll make those changes, uh, especially the vocal. I think that's the most noticeable thing. The vocal is just like mush. It's, it's, it's way too crunchy. It's way too distorted. The whole mix is also way too distorted. Um, and I had a hard time. Like once that's printed in, like it's, it's committed, it's done. And in a way I wanted it to be like that. I wanted to commit to things and then run with it. Uh, but <laughs> if only I could have committed, uh, in the, in the right way to the right things and then run with it. And then, you, you know, you'd be a lot more free. And then, you know, obviously again, I don't know why I automated the fade out on the mix bus and then routed the whole thing to the master bus and then further processed it with, with compression. That's stupid. I should have just automated the fade out on the, on the master bus. So yeah, that's what I would do if I was to do this again. Um, yeah. So, uh, that brings us to the end of the video. Thank you so, so much for watching this video. If you made it this far, um, I apologize for any audio issues. I'm still hearing that buzz on the input of my, of my mic. I'm going to have to work out what, what's going on with that. Um, but yeah, thanks for, for making it this far. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you gleaned some insight into this mix, uh, why I, I chose to make this song, why I chose to approach the production of this song in the way that I did, um, and the lessons I learned by doing it this way, which is a completely novel way for me to do it. Um, so yeah, if you like the video, like the video, please uh, comment, uh, let me know what your thoughts are on it. Um, yeah, share, yeah, share your thoughts of, on, on what you think about my process that I did for this song and any suggestions uh, you might have for me or, or, or if you have any questions for me, feel free to, to shoot me a comment and, and ask it down below. Uh, and also please share it, uh, subscribe to my channel, um, for more videos uh, like this uh thank you again for watching this is the first time I, i've done a video like this the first time i've used this uh software to record stuff um and uh yeah so apologies again for any issues that might come out in the end uh, uh in the final edit such as this this mic noise thing um and also, you know, bad camera angles and things like that. I'm still trying to work this out. Uh, I promise you the next one will be much more refined though. Thanks again for watching. Um, yeah, have a great day. Take care. See you next time. How do you stop this? Uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> take two of thanks again and see you next time thank you again i can't thank you enough and stay tuned for the next video cheers